Welcome to the stage. A couple of artists, uh, one of which I'm familiar with and who, know, who I know for a number of years at this point. Uh, I'm really happy it's from the acclaimed studio, uh, Santa Monica studio. Famous for some really great work on th small titles. These are small, small things like God of War. <clears throat> Little, you know, minutely popular video games. But uh, we've got uh, Glauco Longhi and Nate Stevens. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. Real loud. Wake it up, please. Santa Monica Studio. Are we live? Hello. Oh, we were live the whole time, brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Are we cool. live? Here, let me just... <laughs> and we're live now, right? Okay. And, and you're okay with uh, answering questions during, right? Yeah. So if something pops up or you have something interesting you'd like to ask, please just throw up your arm, wave at me, you know, do what you got to do, maybe make a sound and all. We'll make it happen for you. Yeah, okay. we will be taking questions during the presentation, and of course, I will be speaking uh, stuff more related to characters and Nate about environments, but if you guys have questions on how those two are related or whatever, feel free to chime in. Uh, so my name is Glauco. I'm a lead character, character artist over Santa Monica Studio. Uh, I don't want this to be too much about uh, my story, and there's like a couple of videos already online. But, so, I put a lot of thought on what I wanted to show you guys today, and I actually ended up changing the presentation quite some time, quite a few times, and I decided to showcase a model that I'm working on, but slightly different. So, I want to kind of simulate a production environment where I don't have a fully concept already done by the, the VizDev group, and it's more like a. It, it's more like I have one a little bit of the concept, and I'm sketching something, and I'm working back and forth with the concept team. So how that kind of stuff would work? So basically, this is the model I'm working on. The head started based off on a Carlos wanted design, and I have huge respect for Carlos. So I don't want to talk about the design or discuss any of that, especially for the head. But basically, I started with the head, and then I'm now going with the body, imagining that I'm working with the VizDev group, trying to figure out what this character is going to look like or it's going to be. And I recorded the entire process, so I'll be playing a time lapse and explaining everything that I'm doing, but just to show you guys a little bit of uh, how I have this file set up. If I erase everything, I have one, one sphere for the head, where I did this quick sketch or more like a, not very sketchy looking like. Uh, and I have a couple sub tools for a couple different things. And I have the arms, like the arms are like very rough compared to everything else. So this sometimes happens in production as well. We start from the head and then we might go to the body later. So in this case, I'm simulating that we have a head that we know what we want to look like, and we are exploiting on everything else and also on the accessories. So the head, for example, um, it's much more refined compared to like these other shapes, and these other shapes are just representative of what it can be. So the concept team would be sketching on top of that, and we would be going back and forth like I mentioned before. Uh, one thing that I want to mention, though, we already had some really good presentations about very fine details. Like Chris, for example, he like killed it. He, he pretty much went over like how to really do fine details uh, the best looking way possible. And for video games, usually this type of very fine details and like pores and that kind of stuff, we don't have the budget for because usually for this head, for example, in a in a game project, it will have the maximum one UV. So I don't have texture uh, support for having like uh, a bunch of details. So we will be relying a lot more on tilers and all that kind of stuff. So the most important thing, even Chris mentioned that as well, like the most important things on any character is the primary forms and secondary forms and eventually the tertiary forms. And in this case, for the head, my primary forms are very refined. My secondary forms are starting to play some role, and the tertiary forms are like very loose yet. And for the body, I have the primary forms in there. The secondary forms are like very rough, and I don't have any tertiary forms. 
the arms I would consider just the primary forms for now, and that's because I don't know what I, what I really want to do with the body. And of course, the, the accessories are just like rough blockouts. So if you guys have any questions on, on any of that or what, how I'm doing this, feel free to join or to chime in. But I'm going to start playing a video of the time lapse. Uh, and just to mention something real quickly, if you guys spot me doing something kind of dumb or very old school, it's just because the way I learned, like back in the day, back in like ZBrush 2 or whatever. And I honestly don't, don't know a lot of like ZBrush fancy tools or uh, the new techniques and stuff. I kind of stopped on, like, on time a little bit on that. And I've been using the same things over and over. And whenever like Igor, for example, is here, he's like, he has a lot of technical skills and he knows how to do a bunch of stuff. So he always teaches me some stuff too. And I pick some of those from time to time, but usually, I work the very old school way. Uh, so this is me starting from just a, a very simple sphere. Did a quick mask. I'm ex like dynamashing everything and uh, extruding a little bit of like the, the shoulder area or just like the trapezius. And now right, what I'm doing here, I'm just trying to find the very rough forms. And You're very fast. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and this is a where I'm going to be spending most of my time, primary forms and secondary forms, which I love doing. Uh, this is usually where I spend like, I would say maybe even like 80% of my time. And since I was saying like, we don't, ha we don't need a lot of fidelity on the very fine details for video games. So I'm not saying that it's not important. I'm saying that we don't have the budget for that. So we usually, I spend most of my time here. Uh, so this is me again, just trying to find like a couple shapes that will help me identify the, the original concept. So I'm putting, throwing in some marks just to kind of find some landmarks and find some areas that I can relate to the concept and compare, or like the size of the eyes and that kind of stuff, but keeping everything loose. And I will keep everything loose as much as possible. Uh, I don't like to use the smooth brush a lot. I read a Lun Terry book like many years ago when I was doing like traditional sculpture. And he describes smoothing as you just keep working on the forms. So you keep like going on smaller and smaller and smaller forms. Although I use smooth like a, you guys just did, what I, the concept that I have in mind is just like keep working on those forms and tightening those up uh, as, you go, as you go on. For sketching things like that, I really enjoy the snake hook brush. It gives me like a very, uh, pencil on paper type of feel so I can really play with like action lines and that kind of stuff. And yeah, that's me just playing like with rough anatomy, trying to get the proportions right. And I will be changing stuff later on too. But there's, I mean, there's no secret on any of what I'm doing. Like, it's very basic commands and ba very basic tools. Uh, the thing I focus my time most on is studying anatomy, uh, studying design, uh, and that's what I really enjoy doing. So I have a, I have a question. Is it the mic on? Hmm. I was going to say that it's quite inspiring because it, it actually showcases that no matter where you are, in your ZBrush, uh, don't mind my touch. Um, it's a family show after all. It's uh, really about no matter where you are in your trajectory in ZBrush, uh, it's quite accessible um, wherever you're coming into it, uh, whether you're, you're Hello. a seasoned veteran or if you're a newcomer. So seeing you do this and seeing the end result before this is actually quite powerful. Um, so it's nothing to be uh, apologetic about. Sorry, go ahead. Does my mic work now? I, it yeah. sounds sure like it, doesn't it? Can we hear him? Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> So, being an environment artist, are you looking at anatomy reference when you do this, or you just yeah, already know it all? Definitely. Like, for the initial sketch for the body, I didn't look on any anatomy at all. But whenever it comes to refining and kind of, I need to do this right, I will always have reference. Even if I'm doing like a torso, I'm kind of known for doing like a lot of a lot of torsos uh, already, and I love sculpting torsos. But on each one of them, I always have references, like okay. for anything. 
And here I'm just showing like some quick poly paint in the eyes just to kind of uh, help me make this look slightly better just for myself while I'm like modeling. Uh, like the eyes are very important on any character. They are like the soul of the character, some say, but. So just having a little bit of color in there kind of helps me out. Some people like to, to work with a lot of with poly paint while they are sculpting, and I tend to just don't do that at all. Maybe because of my background being a traditional artist too. Uh, I really like very simple stuff like I'm using the basic material all day long. Uh, and yeah, I like to keep it simple, pretty much. What brush are you using to do all the little lines? So the lines are the dam standard. I can actually show you guys how I approach some of that later. But the lines or the, the big wrinkles are the dam standard with very low settings. And I use the clay brush for overall build up forms. And I use the standard brush quite a lot as well. And the move, of course. That, that's it. Like, if ZBrush had only like, these four brushes, I would be fine. And it's moved a little bit, too. So you see, like, how this is slowly progressing. And, like, I'm not trying to do, like, a... I'm, I'm kind of working my way up, like, one step at a time. So rotating the model at all times. I work a little bit on the mouth, and then I go a little bit on the brow, and then I go a little bit on like the horns. Uh, I'm keeping some stuff very, uh, very sketchy yet, like the ears and the horns, because I don't know what I'm gonna do with those uh, yet. And I, I think just having the main shapes there, they help me to see the whole picture. Just drawing like some very simple stuff in there too, like some simple shapes. But you see like how much I'm actually working on the zygomatic area, like the jaw, the mouth, and the brow, like I'll keep working on these areas like forever. Like, and even the, the, all the proportions of the, the entire head. So this is the most important thing of any character, pretty much. Also try to get the feeling of gravity on some of those uh, very thick wrinkles on the neck. Uh, one thing that I like to mention, like some people during this stage, they already cut like very, like huge lines, very fast and very deep. I like to keep everything soft and loose. I think loose is the, the word that I like the most for that because yeah, just keep it simple, keep it soft. And here I was just like taking some screenshots and doing some Photoshop stuff on top just to kind of have a different way of seeing that. One trick that I do quite often is take photographs of my monitor or at least seeing the model through my cell phone. Like Chris was describing too, like he flips the model upside down. It's just like another way of uh, checking the model with a different set of different perspective pretty much that kind of helps you uh, see things that you, you couldn't see before. Even though I sculpt most of my stuff using like the basic uh, material, I go and check everything with different materials from time to time as well. Again, I play with the lights, uh, I go on Photoshop. I think the more you, you see different stuff, it, it's better. So here I'm going a little bit more on like finer shapes. Still, still keeping everything loose. But you see like how these secondary forms are building up on top of the primary forms. If the primary forms are wrong, this stuff's never gonna look right. You can use, uh, so here I'm like testing some stuff out. Maybe I wanna do uh, some sort of like different type of bumps, so I'm testing that out. I'm testing like some different type of wrinkles here. They didn't work like at the end, so I kind of erased those. Uh, but it's more like a lot of like, experimentation too. Do you use layers? Uh, I only use layers whenever I'm doing either expressions or uh, throwing in some pores. Or if I know that I want to change something drastically and I want to have like art direction on it, 
or like the VisDev team uh, do some concepts or want to experiment, maybe like the horn is going to be something completely different and I, and I might do that on a different layer. But other than that, I keep, I keep my stuff like very straightforward. Hey, Glauco, I got a quick question for you. This is uh, probably some people are wondering maybe around the world. And there's another one back there as well, so I'll make my way while I ask you mine. Uh, sure. What resolution are you working at with this head? Uh, you mean like the poly count? Yeah. I have no idea. I can check. It's a good question. See, I knew that was this is, question. let me just check, because this is something that I think it's very important to. I don't, I only subdivide if I need to. So I like to keep it uh, as low as possible. Cool. Uh, so let's see, like at that time, I was probably like around this guy. Oh. I was probably like around here, where you guys saw. And this is uh, uh, 200, no, uh, 2 million, is that correct? I can't see that anymore. I'm, I'm aging myself. No, that's total. Like, you see, I don't even care about this type of stuff. Like, <laughs> I like that. Uh, and usually, like, if this is a game project, I would, I mean, there are, like, different cases, of course. If I'm doing, like, a head that's starting from a scan, I have a totally different pipeline. If there are facts or, like, any sort of, like, blend shapes or animations already being done while I'm sculpting, usually that happens for, like, head and realistic characters. That's a totally different approach. But this sort of creature here, I would just sketch everything. And at a point that I'm here, here that I'm at right now, I would probably do like a topology, a good looking topology on top of everything, open the mouth, and sit with the rigging guys and see if everything works. And if everything is good to go, I would do like my final uh, sculpting pass on top of that. So there's a lot of like back and forth with the, with the rigging team in that aspect as well. Hey, question. So uh, on your personal work, how far do you take a sculpt before you pose it? Like secondary forms or? How no. far I take before I pose it? Yeah. Uh, it really depends what I'm trying to achieve. And this guy here, I don't have any plans on posing right now. Uh, I think I'm more concerned with just studying form. Like th this is, but if I want to pose, I would probably just do as much as I can symmetrically if the pose is not crazy. If the pose is crazy, I would just do like a very rough blocking just to get like the proportions and just pose it and just sculpt without symmetry. Uh, this is something funny though, like the more, the more I work in this industry and the more I scoped, the things that are interesting to me, these days at least, are very simple things. And simple by, by, by simple I mean, I'm very interested in learning forms. Like Gio, for example, Gio Nakpil, he's one of my favorite uh, artists and he focused most of his time just studying forms, and that's the type of stuff I really enjoy doing, even when I'm traditionally sculpting as well. Uh, this is just the phase I'm, I'm at, at this, this moment in time. So I would probably, if I really like how things are going with this guy, I would probably just do like a quick pose just to keep exploring form. Uh, I don't know, I just, whenever I'm doing personal work, I, I, I let it go, like I have so much uh, schedule things at work that whenever I'm doing personal work, I just want to have some fun and, or pick a topic and study. Very nice, one more over here in the middle, yes. Hi, uh, you said that this was um, for video games, so is there like a specific poly count that you aim for towards the end of the, the image that you're, or the end of the, your model? I couldn't hear you, sorry. It was for video games. The it's poly if it's for video games, is there a specific poly count that you're working within uh, parameters for? What's the, what's the poly count parameter? That Whenever I'm sculpting, that doesn't really matter much. Like the only thing that really matters is how many UVs I'm able to use on this character. So for a character like this, for example, I would probably use one UV for the head, one UV for the torso, one for the legs, one for the arms, and maybe one or two or maybe even three for the accessories. Uh, that will dictate how much, uh, how much information will be retained whenever I bake the textures. So that's really important. Uh, some people like to sculpt as much as they can. Some people, depending on the, the, on the, on the production uh, you are at to, 
for, I would say, like around 100,000 tries for a character is a good number to follow. Some characters less than that, some characters much more. Some characters have hairs that are just like a, a thousand tries, like a hundred thousand, just the hair themselves. So it, it's really hard to say like a specific number. But if you're doing personal work, I would suggest make good flow topology, make good use of tries and polygons, but don't, don't limit yourself within a budget if you are trying to do like very triple A, this sort of stuff. I get a lot of like, uh, a lot of like portfolios or people like at the studio or even like at personal level saying like, oh, I'm doing this and I point out some things like, oh, like this doesn't look quite right. Oh, it's just because I didn't have like topology for that. Like who are setting up these rules, right? Unless you are trying to go mobile or uh, within like a very specific budget, I would just make things as good as possible. Keeping in mind that you definitely want to show a good use of topology. That's very important. Here I'm blocking in some accessories. Again, this is like very loose and very sketchy. I'm not paying too much attention on. This is like not like a drapery study, right? So like even the wrinkles, I'm just like throwing stuff in. I just want to be able to see some forms, some lines in there, just trying to capture like nice shadows and give that to the concept folks, or even myself on Photoshop, just kind of sketch something, stuff out on top of that. So you see I'm using like spheres and like very simple meshes uh, just to kind of block out all of these accessories. When you do final cloth, do you guys usually do it in here? Do you do like Marvel's design or like a Maya Sim or? Uh, depending on the type of cloth, like a lot of people use Marvelous for most of that stuff. I think it's very useful. Uh, whenever I'm doing personal work, I tend to sculpt everything by hand, uh, just trying to make it the most difficult way so I get more out of that. And you see like the back is like very rough still. Uh, yeah. There's one more over here for you. That was Marvelous designer you used for clothing, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Hi. Uh, I have a question about the, um, well, you have the high poly model over here. And do you work with someone to make the low poly, like, a uh, game ready asset? Or, I don't know, how, how do you work with the low poly topology? Or is how? someone else does it over your model? No, it depends on the project, like, or on the asset. Uh, some assets we outsource, some assets we do in-house. Uh, whenever I'm doing that myself, which I tend to do less and less, just because of like other duties I have, but I do that in Maya with like Maya topology tools, and I find it very easy. And so I just export uh, like a very simple mesh from ZBrush for reference, and I do that in there. And I get lots of questions on the internet about uh, symmetrical or asymmetrical pieces. So, and how do you topologize that too? So this head will eventually get uh, asymmetrical, right? And you don't want to do the topology uh, asymmetrical too. So you either do the symmetry on a layer, break the symmetry on a layer, and then you can, can export that to Maya, or you can just, even if it's asymmetrical, you can still do just half of it, merge to the other half, just collapse, just like collapse everything, merge, and then bring back to ZBrush, and then readjust the stuff. Uh, there is also something very important to be said on topology, like even if I start from a clean topology, let's say I go to Maya and I model this head, do like a very nice topology, whenever I'm sculpting, I will be shifting those verts and those edges. It's just part of like the, the sculpting process. And then the flow will not be perfect anymore. So you, you will have to re-groom <laughs> this topology. So for stuff like that, I, I rather just start without any topology, do like a clean sketch whenever it looks good. I do my final topology and, and go from there. In the case of topology, it's quite easy now, uh, especially with things like ZModeler um, and the functionality that's inside of there on top of like the ZRemesher and the ZModeler together. Those two things, if you're not thinking about them that way, maybe it's a good time to, to start investigating it uh, because it's quite robust. ZModeler, the only thing I really use, and this I pick up from Uyghur as well, or even just the 
the Z remasher thing. I tend to use these tools not very often. Uh, I know they are great, and y you can do amazing stuff with that. But it's just like my personality, I guess. Uh, I, I tend to keep things very simple. But I, I was doing that a little bit here. So I would just mask, extract, select just like a simple shell, and then I can Z remesh that uh, using some settings that I can show. And then you're going to have like a very clean topology strip. And then you can use uh, the Z modeler to just extrude and then insert some loops to retain the shapes and stuff like that whenever you subdivide. So here I'm just showing, like, again, very simple uh, poly paint. I never paint anything flat. I always use, like, zigzag motions. I use the spray brush a lot. But again, my final textures won't be these guys. My final textures will always come from, most of the time, will come from Substance Painter after, after I'm baking stuff. Uh, There's one more over here. Go ahead. Yeah, just a quick follow-up question. Uh, how about the UVs? You, you make the UV maps on on Maya while you retopologize, or you take it back to ZBrush and do it over there? I'm sorry, I, I... He wants to know about the UVs. Well, number one... Oh, my UVs? Yeah. UVs, you have to do them after you have, like, a good topology, right? So after I do, let's say, this guy, this is approved, before doing my final pass on texturing and refining everything, I'll send this to Maya, do my final topology, do my UVs. And then, since I already have the topology, it's kind of up to me to really pay attention to your UVs here in, the, in, the, uh, in ZBrush or not. I would just bring the OBJ, do the final sculpt, make it look good as possible. And whenever I export, I don't have to have a matching one-on-one -on -one for this type of workflow. So even if my UVs are erased during the sculpting process, I just have like a very high poly, a very dense mesh where I'll be uh, grabbing the details from and projecting to this OBJ, which is the low poly mesh. So in this case, the, this specific case, I don't need to retain that. If I'm, again, if I'm doing like a head or something that already has a lot of connections outside of uh, this workflow or like this project itself, uh, you need to pay attention on, on that too. The other, thing is that, um, the other thing was that yesterday we saw if you update, you have a whole new way to approach UVs uh, inside of ZBrush. So that's, uh, you have a question here. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to keep you waiting. Yeah, that's all good. Just a quick question. How long do you think from start to, to this point uh, it has taken you to get this far in the model? Uh, right now, everything that I did here is around five hours uh, to six hours, something like that, because I was editing the, uh, the time lapse last night. And I believe it's like five to six hours total. So it's, it's very rough, it's kind of uh, it's sketchy, but I do like some of the shapes that I have in the head already, so it's fun. I uh, can't wait to get back and kind of keep working on this. Yeah, it's really cute. I was going to say, yeah, if you didn't, if you didn't, catch, yesterday's, uh, if you didn't catch yesterday's presentations, uh, at the end, Paul and Joseph were instrumental in showing some of the new features, There's, uh, the UV stitch and such. You can check that out, uh, and uh, I think it's going to change a lot of uh, perspectives. Uh, any other questions? So this, you see this is very rough. I just want to show a little bit of how I approach sculpting these guys. You see, like, this is very rough still. Like, what I would do if I was at home right now, I would be cleaning up these shapes, right? So how I would do that? You can either do use, like, this clay build up, but I usually use the clay brush. And I found out that if you uh, change the focal shift to very uh, low, like minus 70, something like that, and then you turn down the intensity, you, you actually get like some, some edges after you do these strokes, pretty similar to what you have in the, in the clay build up or the other clay brushes. But I do like this one because it doesn't leave a lot of marks, but just a little bit around the edges. So I would go here and just try like exploring some of these shapes, contour, like going around the form and kind of emphasizing some of that that I really want and trying to keep everything as loose as possible. Again, like not really committing to, I, I want to have something like this, I want to have something like that. Just keep, keep it loose, w look from all the different angles. So you see like this from this angle, it's kind of flat. You have like a really small indent in there. But if you go up, you start to see like a mu much more stuff going on. And you need to understand these type of concepts whenever you are baking out these, these textures and applying those to your models. Because sometimes we sculpt things here, they look great in ZBrush, 
but they look great under certain, certain circumstances, like top-down lighting, that kind of stuff, and you throw that in the game and it looks completely different. So having a lot of like experimentation, even on early stages, if you are still learning a lot of that stuff, I would just bake out some of these maps, put that in the engine, and check like, oh, is this like rib cage being like, is it too much? Is it too loose? Kind of, I mean, just, j just do the stuff, right? Like, if you want to make this look good, as good as possible in game, like, utilize all the tools you have available to you. Don't be lazy and like, oh, I'm just going to do that in the end because it takes a lot of time. Like, even right now, even if I don't have a final topology, if I don't have a proper UVs, I can duplicate this mesh. I can do like a quick Z mesh or even like a decimate, whatever, create like random UVs, put that in the game, see the baking result. Okay, this is looking good. It takes like five minutes to do that. And then you can, you go from there, like, you build up some confidence that what you're doing is going to look good. Can I just interject about that? With the because I'll, I'll I will lose yeah. a lot of sleep tonight if I don't say this. Uh, <laughs> the Z plugin uh, is Peel UV, and you can get that inside of the downloads uh, center inside of the Pixelogic website. So that's uh, if you're if you weren't here yesterday, uh, please take note of make note of that rather. Um, and then also Z Classroom, right? There's there's lots of resources like uh, inside the the website. There's a question in the back. So if you're today, we've learned what we've got the hashtag uh, Ask ZBrush. We got Z Classroom, and we have a plug-in section on our website, which is great. I saw an arm. Hey, how are you? Can you, tell me, can you tell me about your baking process and maybe a little bit about how you do the do you dynamesh your through the project and then go through your details, sub D it, or you no, see I, mesh it? The dynamesh thing, uh, <clears throat> I only use whenever like let's say I'm doing this and I need to extrude something, I would dynamesh. After I'm done with the overall forms, I either do like a Z remesh to have like a cleaner topology to work on. But this guy here, an example, I didn't, did, I didn't do like a, a, a dynamic, uh, Z remesh. I just start subdividing uh, the dynamesh mesh, which kind of works. After I'm done, I would do like a clean topology afterwards, like on an external software like Maya, for example. And then the baking process, I would export this from ZBrush, high poly, I would export my low poly, and I would just do the baking, like, very straightforward and simple. In this case, I wouldn't be able to do in ZBrush because my low poly, it's not here, so there's no, no reference to bake the low poly, too, like the, the normal maps, too. So I would do, like, in Painter, for example. We've got another one back here. Just going to get this gentleman here, pardon me. Hey. Uh, hey, I was just wondering if you could... Uh, you started a bit, but describe a bit more your workflow with polypaint and its relationship to making out the forms, if, if there is any. Uh, I didn't understand, sorry. Ask it again here. If, if, you, if you can describe uh, maybe in a bit more detail your workflow with polypaint and how sure. it relates to your sculpting. Sure. Like. I think there are two stages for me whenever I'm texturing. I can be either just doing like quick sketches with colors, just experimenting uh, different designs or different patterns on the head. This guy, for example, I don't want, I'm not sure if I want the eyes to be white or like to have like this pattern around the eyes. So it's really easy and really effective for me to come here. Uh, we can actually play with different stuff right now. So I'm gonna just swap that to RGB, turn off my Z-Ad, I'm on the standard brush. And I can just pick, like, uh, like, let's say, let's do something around the eyes here. And then I can just experiment uh, stuff like that, like, very quickly. And you see, like, I'm, I never do this. I always keep, like, things loose and kind of build up my sharpness as I go, even when I'm sketching. So I can come here, do this, do that. All right, so this is looking good. Let's say this is approved, and this color palette is the final one that we really want to use in the game. So in that case, I would definitely bake out this map as well. So I export this high poly with uh, the poly paint on, which comes in, uh, in a vertex color information. And I will export that as a map, and then that would be my base for my texturing. Or like you can also do the final texturing here, as Chris was describing, that he's been doing that. You can just poly paint everything. 
I just like to poly paint on, on, on my final asset or just do my texturing on my final asset because I also take into consideration my normal maps uh, and how that's actually reacting to light and uh, that's just my workflow. Thank you. There's another one over here. Hey. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask what program you bake in and also since you're a lead character artist, do you have everyone bake in the same way or is everyone free to do whatever they're comfortable with? Uh, yeah, this is like very. Sorry. What process do you use for baking? Yeah, and uh, go ahead, ask it. In the next I think. Part. Yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> do you have everyone bake their stuff in the same way, or is everyone free that work with you, the other artist, to bake in whatever comf uh, pro program they're comfortable in? Oh yeah, they can use anything. Like, the only rule we have is it has to look good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Like some people. And of course, we have standards, right? Like, whenever you are delivering the final asset, uh, we do have our internal uh, standards for how we're going to keep the texturing files and how we're going to keep the source files. Because if another artist has to work on that, he has to be able to. So we have a couple of standards, but usually it's like whatever you're comfortable with. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, I, we are very fortunate to have access to pretty much any software. So. Excellent. One more over here. And I think uh, I'm going to switch to Nate. So he's going to jump over. Can we slip one more question in here before you leave? No, no, yeah. I'll, I'll be yeah, yeah. Be okay. Here. okay, you ask the question and then they'll do their business up there. How about a round of applause first and foremost for Adolfo? <laughs> a little bit louder here on Saturday, everybody. Make some noise. Thank you. To close there hmm? Wow. Close? It's much louder when you're actually in the audience. I had some hot keys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, so I notice you keep your head separate from the body. Um, I I just want to know what's the thought process behind that, and at what point do you merge them together? So yeah, you can. Uh, you keep your head separate from your body, and uh, the yeah. thought process behind that, and when do you merge well, them together? Yeah, like like I was explaining, the reason for that one is because I started from my head, <laughs> so I work my way down, and. At the end, I would probably just collapse everything, merge everything, and then using the clay brush, I can smooth those two, or I could dynamesh. But it's not like a rule that I always start with the head. But in this, I just wanted to show you something different. Usually, you guys see presentations like on video game stuff saying like everything is perfect, so you have like a approved and finalized concept, and then you do all your modeling, and then you do. But that happens most of the time. But the other way around all also happens too. Like you have like you start something in ZBrush and you prototype stuff and like it it's it, it's all over the place like sometimes, which is pretty fun and pretty good. Uh, that that's what I wanted to show you guys here, as opposed to a very strict uh, type of workflow. Hi. You know, I thought when he was gonna say the time lapse like three days or something. <laughs> Five hours. Uh, anyway, um, my name is Nate Stevens. I'm the lead environment artist at Santa Monica Studio. Um, as you guys know, we shipped uh, God of War earlier in the year. And it came out pretty good. Uh, I am also an instructor at the Noman School here on Monday nights. I teach the. Oh, yeah. <laughs> If you've been in my class, you're probably not clapping. But. Anyway, so um, looking at the schedule of speakers, I think I'm the only environment guy, definitely the only environment artist today, and maybe for the whole thing. Just cur out of curiosity, how many environment prop, you know, hard surface guys do we have here? Or oh, that's, that's a good. significant okay. number, right? It's intimidating for me because I, I, if I tried to do a character like that, it would take me like a year and it would, it would suck. Actually, I tried one time and I showed it to the lead character at the time and he said, mm-mm. <laughs> so, which is fine, you know. Um, so environments. Uh, in the class I teach, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the students are character artists, which is cool. And uh, something that comes up quite often is they like being a character artist because they like being in ZBrush, to which I say, oh, Environment art is in ZBrush all the time, too. 
In fact, it is probably, at least at uh, most studios I know of, and definitely at the Santa Monica studio, it's our main modeling tool. We use Maya for maybe some retopology, but we are in ZBrush the majority of the time. Uh, and what I want to show today is I'm actually going to do a little live demo making like a, a modular piece of geometry uh, using only ZBrush. So, you know, years ago we would kind of do this hybrid approach between ZBrush and Maya, you know, uh, 3D Studio Max, whatever. Now you can start and end most things in ZBrush. So I'm going to attempt to kind of demo some of that stuff live today. Uh, so we'll be covering a lot of little things very, very quickly. Uh, first off is, as an environment artist, we get this all the time. Pictures like this, they're like, hey, build this. And uh, if you were to hand sculpt all of this, obviously that would take like five years. So we have to be very tricky. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover in, in a 30-hour video game. We try to keep the fidelity to at least try to compete with the, the character art, which it obviously cannot, but you know, we, we, we try to get there. Uh, so we have to do things in this, this magic word of modularity. Meaning that in a, in a building like this, um, we will try to break it down into pieces that look like this. Pieces that can tile, and you could turn these into column bases, arches, door frames, whatever. Uh, this kind of modular geometry, like I was saying years ago, you'd pretty much be in Maya to, to lock this stuff down because it has a nice grid and, and tools like that. But uh, as things change, especially with some of the newer additions to ZBrush, we can just start right here. So um, first thing I'm going to do is load in uh, a texture. And this will be our piece of reference that we will try to match. So I'm just going to load in this guy and then grab it and send it to the spotlight. We'll just kind of scale this guy, throw him up at the corner here. It's good to always work from reference. Um, if you just do stuff out of your head, you're going to mess it up. That's just, just kind of how it works. So looking at this, this has a nice profile, and this would be a perfect candidate for something like a trim piece up here, a modular piece, as, I, as I've said. Um, so the starting point is we will make a cube. And don't make fun, environment arts, a lot of cubes. They say, oh, cubes and tubes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you're going to see, we're going to use. Holy smoke, it's a family show, man. A family show. We're going to use tons of different tools at our disposal to, to make this happen uh, pretty quickly because we, like I said, we have to cover a lot of ground, so we've got to work fast. So I'm going to switch. I'm kind of like Glauco. I just like the basic, basic material. It will not lie to you, but we will use other materials later. So by default, this thing is gridded up in a way that's not super helpful. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn this into a, well, we can actually go to the initialize button here and crank some of this stuff down to get a more simplified shape. So I'm going to start with something like this, because this is kind of what you would start with in Maya. And also, I'm going to go here to the size, and we'll just make this 25 by 25. And turn on the floor here just to make sure that I have my orientation correct and it looks like I do. So this is the bare bones modular piece that we're going to make out of this. Uh, I'm go ahead and make this a polymesh 3D. And then one of the newer brushes that's really helping us a lot as environment guys is this Z modeler brush. This thing's like magic. For example, we have the, this cross pattern at the top which is not the greatest topology to start working from but I can quickly go to the points and go to stitch, and I can just clean this up by stitching this to this, and then going to the delete edge and just cleaning it up that way. Um, what I'm going to do now is divide this up. So one of the reasons um, people kind of start in a traditional 3D package is the grid. And ZBrush, although it doesn't really have a standard grid like you're used to in uh, Maya or you know, 3D Studio Max, the default pieces that come in are snapped to a, a certain unit. So if you were to import this into Maya, for example, this is two centimeters wide or two meters wide, depending on your, your Maya settings. So we can actually leverage that. And that's what we're going to leverage, that under the hood fact that this thing is actually a 
gridded off piece. We're going to use that to our advantage. We're going to see how some of the ZBrush tools actually take advantage of that under the hood. Um, so first thing is, I'm just going to come in here to my edges and we'll just insert some multiple edge loops. So I pick the multiple so that as I click here, it'll just divide this evenly. It'll just put one right in the middle. Can you guys hear me OK? I'm going to do a quick q and You have an impedance problem. There's what? an impedance issue. What's impedance? This is happening to me. Impedance is when a cord is bending and you're not getting proper audio signal. It's going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> See what happened there? So anyway. So how has the Z-Modeler really uh, shifted your, your approach to making these um, assets from the get-go? That's, that's my question. Describe the difference between this and what you might have done before this uh, Z-Modeler magic was available. Well, we would have done this in Maya, for example, and then had to kind of jump back and forth either using, um, what, what is that, uh, GoZ plugin or something. I should prep, I should prep with this on. I'm like a game show <laughs> host. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now can you hear me? I feel like the Mickey of ZBrush. Good? You're all right, Chip. Okay, so if you couldn't hear me before, sorry. <laughs> but I'm glad we sorted that out now. I just got to get this thing to stay. And you don't like going back and forth, right? You like to just My ear. stick in here. Hang on a second. What's happening here? Am I going to touch him again on the pants? This is weird. Glocko, can you hold this for one second? This is getting more comedic. Somebody quick take a picture. Saturday night, I don't know what's going to happen in Hollywood. I'm literally grabbing his pants. That's, that's true. But you, you can hear me? You can hear me? I can talk louder? All Let's right. give it up to Nate. He's if, a good sport. If you can't hear me, just raise your hand and yeah, say. Put, it, put your hands together. He's a good sport. I'm over here. <laughs> it's like the David Copperfield show. <laughs> anyway, jump back in. I used the uh, insert to just kind of grid this off a little bit so that I can match the profile that we're seeing here in. Let's go ahead and move this so we can actually see it. There in the, the reference picture. All right, so uh, polygroup's really important for grouping stuff. I'm just going to, you'll see me do this a bunch of times. I'm going to group this by normals just so we can kind of see where the different faces are. And then I'm going to go back into the faces on the Z modeler brush and use this polygroup button. This is pretty cool because I can go in here. Let's actually turn off the floor. So I'm pretty much trying to make this profile quickly, which again is something we do in Maya before. What I'm going to do then is hold down Alt and click these faces to give them different polygroups. And then switch to Q mesh and just drag these out. Same thing, go back to polygroup, make some new polygroups, and then Q mesh to drag the, whoop. Ah, so I have two. I just need to say the target is now all the polygroups I just made, and drag that out. Do a similar thing to the top here. I kind of have to count down, you know, how far do we want to go? It's probably. We probably want this guy, this guy, this one, and this one. And you know, it, none of this is destructive. If you don't like it, we can, we can fix this later. And we'll go back to Q Mesh, and I'm dragging that out specifically to kind of tackle that bottom edge here. Rinse and repeat. Drag this one out a little further. And that's it. We have a rough profile done very quickly, uh, and I don't have to jump, jump between software. So. I do have one question, though. Yep. So <clears throat> if you are working on a specific asset and you don't have like a profile image, do you guys ask the VizDev, or do you guys do that yourselves, trying to figure out the profile? Uh, good question, yeah. I mean, VizDev will feed us a lot of profiles and stuff, or we'll, we'll find it ourselves. Either way. Um, and then also, Nate, just to match, if you wanted to match when you were making the extraction, you would just basically have clicked without making the move to match the last extraction you made. Oh, that's a pro tip. 
Yeah, that was a pro tip. So if you wanted, if you wanted to make that extraction happen at the same level as the first one, so they would snap, you just click it without making any move. Okay? Does that make sense? I'm putting that in my memory. The last time. distance you used, you just click on it, and it'll go the same distance as the last time until you make a change, okay? That was like a leather right. jacket tip, I don't know. So I'm going to refine this profile a little bit. So I'm going to do some stuff like uh, stitch this point to this point. Now, let's be efficient here. And we always want to work the fewest amount of clicks possible. So if I turn on something like symmetry, then we can weld that together like that. Now, moving points around is, is a breeze as well. So this has this kind of kinked action right here. Uh, that's as simple as I can just mask these points, for example. Invert the mask and then hit R to bring up the new move tool, which I can promptly set to the center of what I masked, and then just scale this down. Sometimes the scaling goes a little slow like that, but no matter, we can just do it point by point. And there we have a rough profile of this. This probably has additional bevels and stuff, so if I was in Maya, now would be the time you'd put those in. But the cool thing about being in ZBrush is we can get that done super fast later, and we don't have to do additional uh, low poly modeling. So now we have this curve thing to deal with. So the way we can handle this kind of stuff now, which is new, I'm going to actually start using the live Boolean feature. Which, which is new and another reason to kind of stay in, in uh, ZBrush. So I'm going to go to my sub tool here and just append, let's see, a cylinder, which came in giant, of course. Uh, we'll just switch to this sub tool and scale it way down and rotate. Hold shift to get that to snap. And I'm going to turn on where we got it, uh, transparency, just to see, you know, how big this thing is. Scale it down. And this is a very common environment art practice is just kind of combining primitives together to make more elegant shapes. So we have this bottom kink right here, and now I need to get this thing, which is a combination of a sphere, something like that, and then it extruded a little bit. So to do that, no problem. I'm just going to, oh, my brush is huge. Don't be so big. Let me just grab the top, modify its ball G, delete hidden. And then I can come in, I still have my Z modeler brush active. One of them is closed. So we could just close this hole. It gets a little bit messy. So if you want to be super clean about it, we can just uh, delete complete edge loops like that. Or m remember, we want to be uh, as fast as possible, so I'm going to hold down X, and we'll just symmetry delete all these guys right here. If they're not needed, why deal with it? And then we'll close the, close the hole, and that's much cleaner. Nice. Uh, second thing I'm going to do is, since this made me a nice new poly group, I can just go to the Q mesh and just Oh, it, now it's not wanting to obey me. Can oh, I get a question asked out here, Nate, while you're doing that? Do you mind? Poly group. Group by normals again, and then... It's in the zone. Okay, go ahead. We'll just re-polygroup this guy. Uh, yeah, real quick, a little bit ago when you were working on the bottom, how do you, how do you isolate the gizmo tool to a specific face? How did you do that while you were in Z Modeler? You mean where I had grabbed... The I think when you centered it first and then you grabbed the vert, uh, that's inside of the... You go ahead and answer that. I'm uh, were you talking about where I hit this to it. kind of yeah. readjust? Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the menu appears... If you click around for a couple minutes, it's pretty self-explanatory what it, what it can do. Um, that's your go to center of mask is the, uh, the little tab right there, yeah. right? And, and then you can... Mesh, and then that's a reset the orientation. And then the unlock is obviously to give you the... Yeah. I'll be using this a little bit later, too, but if you rotate an object, for, well, where'd my object go? And just for the record, those things on the end are not pizza boxes, Joseph, wherever you are. Okay? It's an inside joke. Anyways, what I've tried to make here is a 
sort of a, a cutter object to get this, this cut right here. So, you know, something along those lines, and we can push and pull the points later. Go ahead and scale this guy really big. And then go to the sub tool and set it to this little subtractor button. Turn off transparency. And we can click this button, which is like heaven for us now, is we can just subtract this piece out, take away the polyframe. We have a nice curved piece where we didn't have to, you know, do booleans in some other program or creasing or anything like that. Super convenient. You will notice, though, that it's quite faceted. Um, so again, that's easy to fix. We can just go uh, solo this guy out again. And I'm going to use this magic button I keep loving, the group by normals. And then what I want to do is I want to add a crease where each polygroup ends, which there's a sweet button right here under crease, which is crease polygroup. And now I can divide this up so it's, it's perfectly smooth. And if we jump back here and then uh, go out of solo mode, see now we have a nice, clean, clean edge. Okay. And so this is super fast, again, because in, in Maya, to do this, we would, have, we would have had to add creases and smooth it out and maybe save that mesh off. And here, we can just get right to it. And I can be modular. You know, that, that's like the, the rad word for environment artist. Watch, I can now duplicate this guy, flip it upside down. Yeah, it's long destructive as well. It's great. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, the cool thing is I can come in here and move this around if I don't like what it's doing. Scale it. Uh, we're actually going to put this on steroids a little bit, a little bit later. And I'm just going to duplicate this sh shape to get that curve up there and move it into place. Something like that. And we now have the base of our profile. You know, and if I hadn't been talking, I could have done this in, in just, just a couple minutes. Now, once I'm done, this is, none of this is official yet. Uh, so this one is subtracting. This one is adding on. You got to go to this Boolean button, and then here's where you save. So I'm actually going to save. We'll call it demo. Because certain operations, these computers are sure are great, but if you're on kind of like a laptop or something, they can just kick the bucket at times. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say make Boolean mesh, which made this new mesh up here that's just one subtool. And if we look at the polyframe, you can see where it kind of stitched everything together. Which is, it's pretty amazing how, how good it booleans with how many polygons you can throw at it. Not to name other softwares, but, you know, uh, doing this with lots of polygons is super convenient. It's fair to say it's unique without naming any other software. Yes, yeah. yeah, very unique, very unique. Nice uh, so, let's go back to the original goal, which was to make a tiling piece of geometry, something like this. So this piece from left to right will tile. You can pretend like this is UV0 and this is UV1. And just for reference, I'm going to go ahead and append in the plane 3D. And this is a good way to visualize your 0 to 1 UVs. Um, and so what I'm going to do is give myself a little bit of sculpting buffer here. I'm going to take this and just drag it off a little bit. So I can sculpt up to this point, and I don't have to worry about any deformation adding a crease in the normal map once I need to bake it out. So again, none of the sculpting will be part of the UVs, but it will tile based on, on this. So if you're familiar with the, for example, I'm going to divide this up a bunch. If we go to like the clay buildup brush and turn on wrap mode, you know, this is the way to get something to, hey. Da, 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 da. Thanks for the help. See, so now we can, what? this line here is where the, it will go from one side to the other. So just mocking that up lets us know that this tiling geometry piece, this is where if I'm painting something on this piece, it'll continue on the other side.
Uh, and I'll just undo that so that it doesn't look all messy. And let's further refine our piece. I'm going to now go to the brush section here and select my clip curve brush and use this to trim off an edge. Or, better yet, trim off both edges with symmetry on. And then also trim off the top. So I could probably get a little closer in. Like so. And now we have our super rad profile. And we know as we now move into the sculpting phase, so the block out phase is kind of done, we're going to sculpt on this and we can visualize where things are going to tile. So now's a good time to kind of duplicate that subtool in case we need to go back and then move into a good old DynaMeshing. Now DynaMesh is based on your size. And this is another good reason to start in ZBrush because since we've started with a ZBrush primitive, these numbers will play nicely together. For example, I can, uh, we'll just turn off blur. Oh, maybe we have a little bit of blur. And uh, I'm going to pump the resolution up to like, uh, let's say, 1,500, maybe 1,700. What I'm after at this point, so this is kind of where environment art and character art kind of look at things a little differently. Character art will like start kind of low res and add up. We'll go, we will a lot of times go right to the topology. So I'm looking for about 4 million uh, points in, in this, this thing so it's fully sculptable. Uh, and I think somewhere around this, this number should give it to us. That's where we wait. It's doing magic. In the old days, before DynaMesh, we would go into Maya and have to cut this stuff up manually. So all the kids have it easy now. Uh, in the days of yore. Right? Huh? Oh, in the days of yore. Yeah. The old days. Not Any questions out there in the audience? Hey, there's an arm that sprung up. How are you? Yes, ask now while it's doing magic. Uh, Catherine, yeah. I have a good memory. Um, what is the best way to handle scale in ZBrush? To handle scale? Scale, like proportion of one element to another. Like in, in the different uh, architectural program, you would have uh, numeric measurements. And in ZBrush, you can do um, units in the transpose tool, but it's eh. um, okay. So hopefully this is the an answer that makes sense. Is for environments at least we want everything to be the real size that it is. Okay, so we don't pretend things are littler. Even though Maya does this weird conversion where you work in centimeters and we pretend that they're meters, that's a, a different technical kind of problem. It's Canadian. Oh. <laughs> is that coming at Canadian? We want it to be real, and that's also because we have very strict textile density requirements. And if you just make an asset, that, and textile density means you never scale an asset and you never scale UVs. You want every pixel to be the same size in the environment. And that's one of the things in, in God of War we're very strict on to make sure you know, uh, all the pixels are, are the same size so you don't have a blurry thing next to a sharp thing. Very important. So I guess the answer is make it real size. How do you do that? Um, so, I just happen to know that the, the default cube in um, ZBrush is a two meter cube, I believe. Uh, and two meters roughly is someone as tall as Glauco, like a big tall guy, big tall strong guy. Uh, so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll go into Maya and we'll just make a two meter cube and be like, hey, that's roughly the size of a person and then model accordingly to that to make sure we're at scale. Plus, you know, being a video game engine, we can always throw it into the engine and run up to it and then check the, the size too. But size is super important to get quick. Um, and so this thing here, I, maybe I didn't explain, I, actually I know I didn't. Um, this is built to be the actual size that it, that it would be in the game. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> You can find me after, although we're, I think we're doing portfolio review after this. Uh, you know what? Stick around. I have something for you. Stick around. Yeah. Yeah. There's I a way to, to get that. To I promise to get that taken care of for you. You do the portfolio thing, and I'll take care of that. Okay. Yeah. Deal. Yeah. You owe me Good a deal. Beer.
Good deal. Yeah. Good All deal. right. In the back, I saw an arm. Don't be shy. Welcome, my friends, to the show that never ends. All the way over to the left. Let me see if my arm stretches that far. Hi. Uh, I, was I was wondering, what was the uh, Tixo density used for uh, God of War? Uh, so God of War is no different than most AAA games right now. Uh, and it's 512 pixels per meter. So a meter by meter, if we were to look at a meter by meter uh, plane right now, a 512 by 512 texture would map to that. Yep. Now we start talking about like 4K and next gen <laughs> stuff, that's different, but uh, currently 512 per meter. Is there any other questions or shall I go? All right, I'm gonna keep doing this because the magic finished it's now at 3.7 million. And this is a question we get all the time. It's like, how many polygons is, is enough? For us, you can't have too many. It's never Because enough. once you bake it down to a, a, a texture, uh, the worst case scenario is you're losing some, some detail. You're better off not going too low is the error, though. If this was only 500,000 and I was to bake this at 512 per meter, you'd probably see little squares from ZBrush poking in there. So we tried to go high. I was aiming for about four, but I, I could tell you for something this big, this is more than enough uh, resolution. So Dynamesh is, is awesome because it added all these squares. We can now, oh, I hit the wrong button. You know, we can now sculpt on this, no problem. Uh, but some of these edges are a little bit rough, and this is where we'll start abusing this polish feature here. Uh, Polish. It's like the hot dog. It's capital P, right? It's the only so, so people wonder sometimes, like, hey, how many assets go through ZBrush at, at like our studio? And the answer is all of them. Almost everything goes into ZBrush. You know, it has to be some kind of strange exception. And then, you know, even hard surface stuff goes into ZBrush to dent it up. And this polish feature is one of those things that is, is really cool. For example, with the button off, I'm going to crank the polish up. What it's going to do is take the edges and kind of give them this pillowing effect, which looks really nice for metals, plastics, hard surface stuff. And here's where I, you save again. Right. So see how it gave that nice, like, pillowing look? That's cool. So if you're doing some kind of plastic, some kind of mech armor, I worked on a game called Titanfall a while ago, and we kind of took every piece and threw it in here and, and did this to it. Looks neat. Um, but for what I'm going to do, that's a little too manufactured looking. So I'm just going to check the polish button and just nick this up a little bit. And this is what's going to give us that free bevel I was talking about. The bevels that you would have to put in in Maya, for example, we can just get by cranking this polish up and letting it bevel our edges for us. Ta-da! Very nice, very clean, very realistic. Nothing in the real world has that perfect CG edge, uh, which is another sort of uh, game environment art rule, is we bevel everything. We never leave edges too, too sharp. It's really pretty. Yeah. And so this, I mean, this looks uh, quite nice. Yeah. Cool. So at this point, if you just wanted a clean model, we could send this out and start baking this now, and you could do some work in, in Painter. Um, that's not as fun as wrecking it. And this is what ZBrush excels at, is just destroying stuff. So we're going to destroy this a little bit. Um, where'd my pen go? So in the past, so the workflows have changed, especially in the last year or so since some new tools have come online. You know, the traditional way of dealing with this kind of stuff is you start with a brush like um, Trim Dynamic. Oh, come on. There we go. You know, and we'd use this to dent some edges, something like that. And then we'd probably proceed on to something like Clay Buildup at a sort of a lower Z sub level for more defined pieces. And on something this large, you know, you could spend a day sculpting that. Still, that's not, that's not uh, a bad use of time. But with what we can do now uh, with some of the new tools, I'm actually going to flip this on its head. So instead of working from low to high, I'm actually going to work from high 
to low, I mean, we're just going to take out the big chunks right off the bat using, now you're going to, don't laugh because this is like, it's going to look a little crazy at first. So I'm going to append, I'm actually going to save. And then we'll append in a sphere. We can go to solo mode and shrink that down. Let's we'll turn on transparency. Shrink this thing down. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to make sort of a Boolean subtractor object, something that we can use to just cut pieces out instead of having to do it by hand. And the live Boolean stuff makes that super easy and fast now. And it looks better. That's just the reality. Uh, so let's see, we'll go to solo mode, check the topology, throw a quick Dynamesh on this. Uh, great. And I'll divide it up. You know, we'll go for something like, sure, even 500,000 points. So we already have kind of a lumpy looking cigar here. Uh, what I'm going to do now is start abusing the surface noise. So this is very cool for just kind of creating a, you know, proceduralism is big. Using Designer now, uh, Houdini we use a lot at work. We're, we're, we're getting into that. So just by adding a procedural noise, zoom in here, I'm just going to up the scale and then mess around with this curve a little bit to get to be a little bit more extreme. We can get this to bump out. You know, something like that's probably pretty good. Say OK. And that just made this little cigar type rock. And I can just go ahead and apply that to the mesh. Now that's a bit, that's a bit bumpy. So we'll just dial that back a little bit. Take the strength down. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Uh, you don't need a whole lot of bumpiness to it. In fact, if you have some of this is probably a little bit too much, so I'm just going to one more time take it down a little bit more, just a little bit more. There we go. Okay, great. Apply that to the mesh. Um, that's good for some areas that are bumped out. I want to also push some areas in. Kind of looks like a piece of poop, I know. Don't. It's like... This is my character art. It's like Mr. Hanky, that guy from the South Park. <laughs> <laughs> Looks good. It's good, right? Can I, can I get into the department? Yes. <laughs> okay, so ZBrush comes with these sweet noise makers. This one's pretty good. You don't really see it up front. I'm not sure why it tinted blue, but that's just how you can undo that real quickly. I'm going to edit that now and adjust the scale till we see that. So this is adding some more negative space, big chunks. like that. But this time, I bet you if I hit apply to mesh, it's going to freak out. So freaked out a little bit. No worry. Instead of doing that, we'll just mask that on. So we have now a nice mask of this. And I can grab a brush like clay buildup. And we can just push this in manually a little bit. And you probably don't want to go too extreme, but it really depends what you're making. And then I'll clear the mask and let's see where the floor is. Go back to the trusty move brush. I, I too, like Glauco, don't use that many brushes. Let me just uh, deform this a little bit. Ta da! There's my character. Ship it. M. Ship it. This would have to go to rigging to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well played, sir. Well played. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now, now let's do the cool new, new magic is I'm going to take this, Kinda set it like to be a dupe. subtractor object, and with live Boolean on. What's that, what? 
Hey, that's not illegal anymore. <laughs> Turn off transparency. And now we have this sort of subtractor object. Check this out. Ta-da! Whoa. We'll just place this along the edge. And look at that. That's a nice, beat-up edge. Beautiful. It's really crisp. Doing this hand sculpting would have required me to make a mask, a very sharp mask. But now I can just do this kind of action to it. It's pretty cool, huh? Rotate it around a little bit. We have this nice broken up edge, and it's non-destructible. That's the cool part, all right? And, you know, it's cool that it kept my, tr my uh, transformations right there, but if, you, if I want to undo that, I can just Alt-click here, oh, and it pops it back into place. So now what I want to do just to be efficient is I'm going to duplicate this a bunch of times and just place it generally where I think we could have some good detail. Maybe some stuff down there. There. So remember, this is going to be a tiling piece of geometry. If I was to add some big feature, some smashed out thing, you'd see it tile. So as an environment artist, this is where we kind of walk this tightrope of, it's got to look cool, it's got to look custom, but not too custom so that you notice a, a, a tile. So I'm kind of evenly spreading out some of this detail, my little cigars. And what I'm going to do now is just go uh, turn them all off. And one by one, turn them back on and set them to subtract. Okay, they have to zoom in. And just kind of rotate them around a little bit, scale them, rotate them like this, move them up. Until I get some broken edges, some kind of composition that I, that I like. Um, if I had some reference, it's a good time to be looking at the reference. All right, so this one here, just rotate it this way. I can even do this faster with a mouse. Nice little dent right there. We have 10 minutes? OK. 10 minutes. So if we have 10 minutes, I'm just going to do this on the top edge instead of the whole thing. Uh, but check this out. You can use brushes like the Move brush. Now, I can go in here and you know, really refine this. And scale it down some. And we'll just kind of deal with this top edge since I think we're getting a little low on time. Uh, but I mean, look at that. If I had sculpted that by hand, that would have been, I don't know. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have looked as good. It wouldn't have been as flexible. And this is very cool. All right, so uh, two more things I'll end up doing to this, this model at the time we got is, um, now that this, this is in here, I got to lock it down, so I'm going to make another Boolean mesh out of this. There it is. And uh, ZBrush has some really cool ways of adding surface noise. One thing you can do is go into this noise modifier here and hit recenter and frame. And you can see the little noise it's adding, uh, which you can mess with and make, you know, kind of custom curves and whatnot. You can also import height information. So if you've gone on a scanning trip recently, you have some cool photogrammetry thing, height map, you can import that in. So I'm just going to grab 
something that's from the textures.com library. You, can, you guys can all get to it. I'm going to turn off this mixed basic noise. And we'll just crank this up some. You know, and this gave us some of that nice surface information. And the cool thing is, if you stick to real numbers up here, this will, scale, this will tile as well with your geometry. So I'm going to go to the noise, noise scale here. No, the, I'm sorry, the alpha scale. Make this 0.5. Hit OK. And look, we have some cool detail here. If you wanted to paint that by hand, you could mask by noise and just paint it where you wanted. Or in this case, I'm just going to apply it to the mesh. And there it is. Uh, there would be a little bit of stretching. So if, there were, if I had time, I'd reorient this and reproject it a couple times or create a morph target and paint it out. Uh, but for the, you know, the purpose of this demo, really quickly, we have something that's starting to look pretty realistic. And we haven't done anything really, uh, you know, this isn't straight photogrammetry. On top of that, we can use one of the uh, noise makers. We'll go back to this one so it corresponds with the cigar. And check this out. There's, there, here's a lot of nice procedural type smashing that you wouldn't want to do by hand. And we'll just scrub this down. You know, somewhere around 50s probably. Oh, five zero. Hit OK. Mask by noise. We have a nice mask of this. And if I switch to, for example, the displace brush, which is one of the brushes I use most. We can just start painting in some, some additional surface detail wherever we want it. And we can do a little fishing here. We can take an edge up here, just kind of use this to break up that edge. So I'll focus a little bit on this edge since this is the one we actually did some work on. And I'll be hitting Control-H a lot just to kind of back up, see where my personality is. Back to Control-H, paint some stuff in. You know, until we get something that looks, looks cool. Finally, so like I said a little bit ago, this, the stuff I'm doing now is typically what we do at the end of the process. Now, since I have some, some nice detail in, it actually makes a lot more sense to now go to Trim Dynamic. Since I have these kind of landmarks made, I can do stuff that makes a lot more sense. Oh, clear my mask. So now I can kind of build around some of the stuff I've done and just add imperfection to all the edges and a little bit of hand sculpting around some of this stuff doesn't hurt. And I would say uh, in the PS3 days and even on early God of War, we'd probably spend a day or two sculpting a piece like this, you know, uh, because it could be, since it's modular, it can be reused in so many ways, it's, it's worth the time. What I was able to pull off in this demo is this is a pretty final looking top edge just by using some of the, the new tools. Uh, I think that about covers it. I kind of wrestled up. Thank you. Kakalongi and Nate Stevens. Kakalongi and Nate Stevens. Wow.